All right, good morning, Oasis. Um, this morning, you would like to go ahead and get seated. Um, we are going to change up a little bit like we did last week. Uh, so, my name is Austin. Um, I'm a pastor here. We worship, um, organize all that for you guys. Uh, so, we're going to do it a little bit different this morning. We're going to uh, talk about worship, and then we're going to do it. Kind of like we did last week with Eric. Um, maybe we were here a couple weeks back and uh, didn't have your vacation scheduled. So we, um, we, we did a discussion on kind of just what worship is. And I wanted to just recap that for us. It was like fresh for us. We're going to continue talking about worship today. Um, there's a lot to talk about about worship. And uh, so I'm going to try to just keep it like under 450 words a minute. Um, just kind of cram it in. Uh, this is going to be like a general, I'm just going to hit you with a lot of stuff, and hopefully we can start to integrate that into who we are and how we um, interact with God. So, uh, last week, or not last week, weeks ago, we asked the question of why do we even worship? And ultimately, it's because of who God is, right? It's because of who we actually worship. So, God created us to worship Him. We're commanded worship him. Right? He tells us to worship him. And you're like, awesome, well that, that seems like pretty like self-absorbed of God, right? And you're like, no, it would be self-absorbed if I said that. Because I'm not the center of the universe. I'm not the author and creator of everything. If you are the author and creator of everything, it's actually the best thing you can ask of someone, right? If you're the source of love and joy and all those things that God is and truth in the universe, the best thing you can give to people is more of yourself. Right? So that's why we're commanded. Then, actually, worship is just our natural response to God. Like, we have to do it. Every time we see the scripture of someone see who God is, like God reveals like a tiny little piece of himself to them, they have to worship. In fact, when people see angels, his messengers, way less than they they fall down and worship. They think they're dead. And the angels are like, no man, I'm just a messenger. Worship God. So those main things there. Are why do we um, I wanted to just remind us of a, uh, of a helpful quote, right? If you want to, when we're worshiping, if you want to have, have spirit in truth, tells us that uh, in John 4, uh, 23, Father and Spirit. Just hang with me. This is all going to build on each other, or on itself. Worship, worship the Father and Spirit, and it's true. The Father is seeking such people who worship Him. God is Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship the Spirit. And then he is the kosher. I think, uh, Michael, I have that on the next one. Yeah. Um, he says, true worship of God must be a constant and consistent attitude or state of mind within the believer. It will always be a sustained and blessed acknowledgement of love, adoration, subject in this life to degrees of perfection and intensity. He also says that God wants worshipers before he wants workers. And so we're going to un- unpack that a little bit. right? So I kind of just hit it and threw it out there last time. I'm going to kind of dig in this week. Uh, he wants worshipers before workers. The only acceptable workers are those who have learned how to worship. And he calls it a lost art of worship. All right. So this week, first let's just pray. And as, we, as I pray, would you just pray with me and pray for me um, that I could do this clearly and effectively, that, that God would use me as his mouthpiece this morning, that the Spirit would just be in everything we do. Um, Pray with me, please. Father God, I thank you just for this morning. I thank you that, uh, like I said earlier, that we could get here and we're not all drenched in sweat. Um, (laughs) It's a beautiful morning to just be out and in creation, God. Lord, I thank you that you are the author and creator of, of everything, that you are the source of 
all good in the universe and that you seek to give us more of yourself. Lord, would you open our hearts and our minds to that this morning, to that revelation of who you are, that we could see you and know you and understand you for who you really are, not for the idea or how we have heard others talk about you, but God, how you describe yourself and how your word talks about you. Lord, I pray that, and I, I don't think you're going to do it, but I kind of wish you would, that you would just, like, just open the ceiling and show us, like, your glory. And I know we would die, but, like, gosh, it would be so helpful just so that we could get that picture. I pray that you would just give us a taste of that, that we could taste and see your good this morning as we talk about worship, because it's just so, it's so critical that we get this right when we're talking and we know who we're dealing with, God. We thank you. We love you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so on that note, really, this, this week, what I, what I want us to get is that there's this idea that um, we can either, either have a high view of God or a low view of God. And you're like, well, that sounds like, you know, either you're, you're saved, you're a believer, or you're an unbeliever. No. Um, they fall into those categories, but I would say this is for us Christians this morning. Today, you and I either have a high view or a low view of God, and some, or somewhere in between. So I want to like, start us off with an example of what a high view looks like. So if you have your Bibles, um, go ahead and turn, open up to uh, Isaiah 6. This was Isaiah's view of God. And if you don't know uh, who Isaiah is, he was a prophet, a pretty big deal. Um, he spoke, like, right directly to God, and God said, go say this. And, and being a prophet in the Old Testament was a big deal because you had to get stuff right. Like, you had to be 100% accurate to be a prophet, or you would die. They would kill you for getting stuff wrong. Isaiah did pretty well. So, he was a good dude, right? Like, you, you can't just be like, a, you know kind of like a, a, a kind of bad guy and, you know, be a prophet. God doesn't take those people. Like, Isaiah had some stuff together, and this is his reaction, right? And I only say that to say, like, if, if you want to look at this scale of righteousness, and, and we know that there's not, like, grades or degrees or, like, you know, I'm more holy than you, but, like, I, Isaiah was doing pretty good, right? He, he was a pretty mature uh, follower, if, if we're going to use those kind of terms. So this is what he says in verse 1. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And just get this picture as we talk about this. Like, imagine what's going on. Like, it's, it's interesting, like, in the, in the Bible, when we see these people that had these visions and they're trying to describe this amazing stuff they're seeing. Um, and, and verse 3, it says, And one seraphim called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And it says in verse 4, The foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And a seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal and he, that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. So like you see Isaiah, and, he, and he's like a pretty okay dude. And he's like, man, like he comes before God in his presence and he just falls down and he says, like, he knows he's done for, right? He says, like, I've said some bad things. <laughs> I'm done for. I'm like, Isaiah, that was, like, what came to you? Like, I know some of the things that I've done. Like, what would be my thing if I'm there? <laughs> like, it'd be, like, this long list and we'd have more chapters if I was Isaiah. Like, just the things that I'm going through in my mind that, like, I'm undone because I'm before God in his presence. And so just that, and that you, see, you just see how important, how impactful this is to Isaiah. And Isaiah's view of God is right. 
It's a high view of God. I mean, I just think about this, like, how many times a week or a day do we just throw God's name out there? Like, like do we say it in vain? Do we not realize who we're, we're talking to this God? We're talking about this God. God, like, that I've said a couple things wrong, and so, like, I'm worried that I'm going to be unmade or cease to exist or vaporize or whatever he's thinking right there. And I would suggest to you that often our view, my view, of God is low. Lower than that, most days, I would say. And here's the problem with a small view of God, a, a low view of God. And this is important because I think worship is going to help us out. But we've got to understand kind of like where, where we are in this. So a low view of God leads to self-centeredness, at least ungratefulness. It's this dangerous idea, and we start to like have these thoughts and these questions, and we begin to like judge God for the job He's doing, right? And we're used to doing that, like you know, as Americans, we're like, oh, I, you know, I elected you. How you better do a good job. Um, and we don't really realize like who we're talking to or 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 what we have. So instead of like just being in wonder at who God is. Right, and being like that, wow, I'm this, like, this person, this sinful person, and God is for me, and he loves me, and he, like, his son died for me to like, open up this relationship with him forever. We, people, begin to think like, that he's made for us, that he's made for me, to make me happy. And so like, these questions come next, right? And it's like, God, well, if you're so loving or if you're so good, how come there's wars all over the place? How come people are starving all over the place? How come there's all these bad things going on in the world? Why don't you do anything? Don't you care? And so on and so on. When in reality, like the truth is I'm going to stand before God and one day he's going to ask me, like, you saw all those things going on. You saw those people that were poor and and naked and sick and hungry. And what did you do about it? Because I put you there. Right? Christian? Follow of Jesus this morning? He put me there. He put you there. He's going to judge us based on that. Based on if we know his son. I think Francis Chan kind of summed up this idea pretty well. He said, uh, the solution to our problems is not to look deeper at our problems. It's to look deeper and higher at who God is, right? Kind of like that old hymn, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So today I want us to think about where, where our view of God is. Is it a high view? Is it a low view? Is it, is it somewhere in between? Where should it be? So as we, as we look at worship, worship helps, I think, to increase our view of God if we're doing it rightly, right? So we, we kind of, I hinted at last week that we can be, we want to be worshipers in spirit and truth. I didn't hint at that, I, I said it, and I'm saying it again. We want to be worshipers in spirit and in truth. I hinted at that there's this idea that we could be doing it wrong, right? That there are are unacceptable ways to worship God because we want to worship God how he is said, right? For who he is and not who I think he is or who I want him to be. So what does that mean? Well, let's, let's look about, there's like, there's three, at least three main principles of how to worship God, right? Three big principles. Um, if you're looking at your notes here or taking notes, this is for you people. Um, there's the normative principle, number one. And it's to worship God how he says and the, anything that's not forbidden, right? So I can worship God how he says to worship him in here and then anything that's not forbidden to worship him in here. Normative principle. Then there's the regulative principle. And there used to only be two. Um, so then there's a the regulative principle and it says... We only worship God how he says to worship him and nothing else. 
And that used to be the big debate, the big argument is like, is it a normative principle or is it a regulative principle? And you know, every, we, would, we would debate these kinds of things and, and people would say, you can only sing hymns and, or you can only do songs and then you'd say, well, sing a new song to God and this sort of stuff. And uh, so I kind of wish it was just still that. Like that's, that's an okay place to be, I, I think. Um, and you can probably tell from how we do worship here that we're somewhere in the middle of those two ideas. Um, and so then the third, we have the effective principle of worship. And it basically says, anything that makes me feel closer to God is how we can worship. You see how that can really, see where I'm going with that? That can get a little crazy. So like, it can be something completely unbiblical, but if it makes me feel like I'm getting closer to God, it's cool. Just do it. And I think it's how a lot of places, a lot of, a lot of people, how we, almost, we might most often worship in this way. And I talked about it last week. It's this, this, this way of worshiping that lacks the truth of who God is. Right? The prob, that's the problem with it. Is that we're worshiping a God of our own mind. A God that's right for us. Kind of like Oprah would say, you know? Um, and we say, like, well, it's okay if your heart's in the right place, right? Well, the Bible has a little story about having your heart in the right place and then still just not doing what God has told you to do or doing something that God has said not to do, right? Uh, take a look at 2 Samuel. Uh, 2 Samuel 6, it's the story of Uzzah. Good old Uzzah. Um, so let me, let me just, like, start with this. And uh, so in the Old Testament, you have the Ark of the Covenant. And that's the big deal in this chapter, right? So like, the Israelites have like reclaimed it, and David is making this big thing about bringing it into the city and having it at this guy's house, and they're dancing, and they're worshiping, and this is great. Well, so, let's back up a little bit more. Um, when God was telling them what to do with the Ark and how to make the Ark and how to carry it, he was like, okay, you can only carry it with these kind of poles, and only the people from this family can do it, and it Whatever you do, don't put it on a cart, um, and don't touch it, and only the Levites can be around it, and all that sort of stuff. And so, what does David do? Well, they, they chuck it on a, on a new ox cart, and they're bringing it in, and uh, it hits a bump, right? Well, good old Uzzah's there, and he's like, I know what I'll do, is I'll just keep it from falling. And what happens? He dies. God kills him right there for touching the ark. And David's like, God, what, why'd you do that? And God basically says, because I'm holy, and I said not. So it's, it's kind of funny. A, a lot of you know, people read this and like, wow, God's kind of mean, right? Like God just like straight up killed Uzzah for, for touching the ark. Um, he was trying to do a good thing. His heart was in the right place. Right? But his heart actually wasn't in the right place. Because here's the thing. By definition, if your heart is anywhere other than where God has said it should be, it's not in the right place. And that's hard. Because, like, that hits me right where I live. Sometimes I feel like my heart's in the right place. Uzzah's mistake was thinking that his hands were cleaner than the ground that the ark was going to fall on. That God needed his help there. So, like, God is actually already showing, like, a huge amount of grace and mercy, right? They're already doing all these things that he had said, okay, don't, don't do this. Like, I'm holy. These are the rules. This is how you do it. This is how you're going to worship me, right? And, and they're not. They have it on the card. They're, they're dancing around it. They don't have the right people carrying it and all that sort of stuff. And um, it, it's fine, right? God, God had not done anything, Right? So I, I think we, we often hang on that idea that like we, we just push for grace and mercy and, and nothing else. As long as our hearts are in the right place. So worship is not that kind of stuff. What is more, some other unacceptable forms of worship? Um, 
worship is not primarily external. And you're like, what? Like when, when we, I mean things like this, when we raise our hands, when we dance, when we sing and, and stuff, and don't hear me wrong, right? These things, it's not primarily these things. Don't get, don't, we don't get stuck on those things. Those are, those are external expressions, right? They don't make worship and they shouldn't break it for us. But there are some things that can break down true worship. So don't, again, don't miss me. I'm not saying that worship shouldn't involve emotion. In fact, like, the opposite of that. Like, if you can't tell, like, when I'm up here, like, I cry. I get hyped up. I, I worship and, and privately, like, I shout and jump and dance. And I've, I've gone full David, like, you know, before the, some of you who've read that, like, when Michael gets mad at him, his wife, or, like, I haven't had that discussion with Kelsey, but, um, yeah, with just the loincloth kind of thing. But I, I believe we should have emotion involved in worship. I think it's critical, because that's how we've been made. The question, though, is, am I doing all these things in an acceptable manner to God who I'm here to please with my worship, right? My worship is for Him, right? I, I think we, like, we can agree on that. My worship, our worship is for Him. It's not like Victoria Osteen said one time, and everyone in my worship class at Liberty laughed, worship is not for God, it's for you. <laughs> what? No. Another example in Leviticus 10, Nadab and Abihu, they worship God in an unacceptable way. It says they come before uh, in, into the uh, Holy of Holies and they offer strange incense and make strange fire. And God consumes them in fire. And they're like, what happened? And he said, they were worshiping me in a way that was unacceptable. I told you guys not to do that. Now you guys do it the right way. And then they did. And it's this idea that there's this, like, this experientially driven or performance-based worship that, that we kind of chase after that, that kind of appeals to us because it feels good. I would suggest that true worship feels good. Because again, Jesus said he's looking for true worshipers, spirit and truth. So our redeemed spirit is made new and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, it's no longer ruled by emotion. That's the old self. It's dead. Like, we were dead following the passions of our sinfulness. And in the Greek, when it says the old self is dead, it means dead. Jesus isn't primarily interested in our emotions. He's, he's interested in that, like, that, you know, sorry. He's not interested in our emotions and that they change too much, right? They're based on the moment. They're like, how I'm feeling if I'm coming in sick, if I had an argument. Um, like the, uh, the wise and venerable Pastor Todd has said in, work, in a youth group many times, feelings aren't fact, therefore they're not good sources of truth. Instead, it's, so don't miss me on this, right? It's the connection of your spirit, of my spirit, that's now been established with and by the almighty God of the universe, who personally became the propitiation for our sins and now is alive and seated on the throne of God and surrounded by angels and creatures and elders who, and is being worshipped 24-7 for eternity. And he calls you a son and a daughter and invites you into this to participate in this like miracle of a thing that's going on. And it, we're going to do it this morning and it's something that should cause your emotions to overflow and mine. Someone can say amen right there. <clears throat> Give me a second. That's the stuff that gets me fired up, right? That no way. This is who God is. This is who I'm actually worshiping. This is who I'm actually here for. And we use music and lighting and technology and graphics and fog and lasers and hipster clothes, <laughs> etc., to, to like artificially induce these feelings, right? I'll tell you what, I see a dude in a long dress t-shirt, that doesn't do anything for me, man. I cut that off, I'll help you out. All right, I digress. But it's, it's, it's this kind of emotional manipulation that we kind of just 
accept or, or don't realize is going on. Um, so I, I looked it up, and I was looking in the Greek, and the, uh, the word for this kind of manipulation translates in some of our Bibles to witchcraft. So I looked that up in Greek, and it's called pharmakeia. And it's, it's seen in um, Galatians 5, uh, 19 and 20, which, and, and it's, and it's in, God quite obviously says it's an abomination to God, right there. He says this kind of pharmakeia is an emotional manipulation which is an abomination to him. Any kind of manipulation in that way is called an abomination according to Galatians 5. So this experiential and performance-based or driven worship is just that. It's centered around an experience. Your experience, my experience. And it's about satisfying us. Right? It's, it's that same kind of thing that goes on like when we go to a concert, like a secular concert. Like we see a band, a group, an artist that we like. All these things are happening, right? There's like the cool, he's got the cool outfit on. There's the lasers, there's the fog, there's the people jumping and shouting. And it's this stuff that just gets you amped up. But it's not who they are. John Piper says, true worship comes from people who are deeply emotional, right? Deeply emotional, and who love deep and sound doctrine. My hope for us, my hope for me, is that our view of God would be so high that it causes our emotions to stir because of the knowledge of truth that we have about who he is and our personal relationship with him. So in all this, when, when is the time to worship? When is the time to worship? And I think historically, if we look at the church, it's like an hour on Sunday. Right, it's like right now, like we have, according to this, uh, about 35 to 40 more minutes of, the, of worship this week that can happen um, because that's for the time that we've given it in our schedules, that we've allotted for it. Uh, <laughs> worship is more than that, I'm here to tell you. Worship is, is like we talked about last week, it's an attitude. It's a lifestyle. It's a, it, a, it happens day in and day out and moment to moment. It's not just in good times or like if God has done some good things for me this week and then on Sunday, like I feel good enough about that so then I can sing songs about him. Um, it's not if I've been good enough or holy enough. Uh, if, I've, if I feel like I've pleased God or earned that right to worship, Right? Because that would be based on my works and what I've done and not what he's done. Yet, the truth is, we, we, we need to come into worship uh, with, with, with like a purity about it. Like we should go to him and confess and deal with these things before we come into his presence. Like Isaiah did, right? <clears throat> Again, it's this moment-to-moment -moment interaction between followers of Jesus and him. It, necessi it, bleh, it necessitates, I don't know why I typed all these hard-to-say words in my, my message, and I was like trying to read it, and then you guys think I have a speech impediment. <clears throat> I do, I was just covering it up by saying that. Uh, <laughs> it necessitates as a continual walking out of what we see in Romans uh, 12, right? It's our, it's our daily spiritual worship the renewal of our mind every day. Um, a professor of worship that I had the, uh, the privilege to read some of his books in school, he says this. Um, he's only done worship for like, like 40 or 50 years at this point. Um, so like he's, he's had some experience. And he says, true worship happens when we set our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the Lord. Praising him for who he is and what he's done. I just want to say it again because like, I hope that when you worship, when you hear worship, when you're thinking about it, when I'm thinking about it, that this is what comes back to us. This is like, this is like our, um, our standard for is this like good worship 
Or is, is it maybe something else? True worship happens when we're setting our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the Lord, praising Him for who He is and what He's done. It's understanding God properly, right? So like we talked about those ditches last week where it's like you have like all the passion and no theology over here and then you have like all the theology over here and no passion. No, it's, it's that, like that walking down the middle here. So what, what else is worship? Um, it's so important because when we're thinking about what we're going to sing and, and what we're going to play and, and stuff like that, we think about, yeah, where it comes from. We think about what it says. Right? We think about, is there enough truth in this song? Because the truth is, like, if, even if theology is not your thing, and, like, I like theology, it's kind of my thing, um, and, like, I would always say, like, yeah, I'm not that, like, passionate or emotional. It's, like, it's more like, I don't want you guys to think, like, I'm that passionate and emotional, but, like, y'all who know me, you know. I cry, and if you have a problem with that, we can fight later. Um, but everyone does theology, is the, is the, is the point. Whether you, think, whether you think you're doing it or not, you do it. Um, it's because it's your idea. It's your ideas about who God is. That, that's simple, plain and simple. It's the study of who God is, so it's, it's therefore your ideas of who you think God is. Um, and that's what worship is about, correct theology. If we're going to worship God for who he is, we need to be right on that. Or we're worshiping someone or something else. So we want worship to have teaching, right? It has to have scripture, because how do we know our theology is right? It's because it's coming from here. It's because of, this is what God has said about himself. We look at the words in songs, right? So there's songs that we've done that we've changed the words to, because it just didn't quite fit, or it didn't quite give the best idea of who God says he is. And here's, the, I think, one of the biggest ones that like, I want us to walk away with today um, is what worship is for. Right? So, yeah, it's scripture, it's teaching, it's theology, it's all that. It's, it's warfare. It's a weapon. It's a or tool. You say tool if you are scared of the W word. Um, for believers to use. Where do we see a great example of that? Well, Jehoshaphat, um, right? If you've ever heard of him. Uh, it, he, he comes up in Second Chronicles in verse 20, and, and they're like, so basically, like happens in Israel, they're in trouble. They've got all these other nations that want to just wipe them out. Um, it doesn't look good because they don't have very many people to come and face these other nations. They're like super duper outnumbered. Um, I'm giving you the all standard version, by the way, because it's a, it's a big chunk. Uh, and Joseph asks, like, what are we going to do? And God says, hey, guess what? You're not going to do anything because the battle is mine. I'm going to win this for you. But what I want you to do is you get out there, you get everybody, you put the dudes with the trumpets up front, and you start worshiping, and then see what happens. And so, like, me as a musician, like, this doesn't sound like a great plan to me. Like, when there's, like, bullets or arrows or whatever's flying, like, I want to be behind the guys with, like, the shields. Like, I'll play my drum. You stand there. Hold that up real good. And we can get something rolling. Um, but God says, no, put those dudes with nothing right out in the front and uh, see how their trumpets do against, like, the, uh, the enemy spears and stuff. So they do it. And what happens? Long story short, God wrecks the enemy. They get confused, there's this fog that comes, and they start attacking each other, and it goes terribly, and uh, they all die. <laughs> so, you know, lesson learned. Don't attack God's people. Um, but it's, it's warfare, that's, that's, for it. that's at any time, right? God fights our battles through our obedience in worship. What else is it? It's prayer. Right, so many of, the, many of those, the songs we sing, the words, pray them. Just think about it like that. We're communicating with God. Those, those words are for us. And then think about like this, because this is like 
There's songs that are good to pray, right? And then there's songs like, think about like, if I prayed this in like front of a bunch of people, would it sound weird? You know, <laughs> like, because those are out there. Um, it's, uh, I like to say it's like this difference between like a, a worship song, like a song that we can do here on a Sunday, and like a song that's like nice and encouraging and really has nothing to do with like, you know, how God is and stuff like that or about him. And it's, it's usually songs that say like me or I or stuff a lot. Uh, I call them radio songs. They're good for the radio, but not necessarily in here. So those are what worship is. Then, then the question becomes, like, who can even worship, right? So if, like, there's all these things going on, who can worship? And this is something, like, we think about pretty intensely, or I think about pretty intensely, because, like, I have to decide who's going to be up here and leading you guys in worship, leading us in worship, joining in worship with us. So who can even do it? Uh, short answer, it's, it's those who have been renewed by Jesus, right? Because if that hasn't happened, there, there's really, that, that's like the gate. If you haven't entered through that narrow gate, um, so you're saying, wait a minute, the lost people can't worship? I would say no, not necessarily, because everybody worships something. Remember? We talked about that last week. Yeah. But lost people can't worship God. At least, not the way he should be worshipped. Not properly. So I kind of answer a question with another question. If God's people who have a relationship with him can worship in vain, or, or even we can do it incorrectly, uh, then, then how can those people who have no relationship with him, who have no knowledge of who he is, who have no regenerating work of the Holy Spirit going on in their lives, um, even begin to worship? Because they lack that work of God, that they lack the spirit, right, and the truth of the knowledge of who God is. So at the end of the day, like, who can be up here? It's, it's believers. Who is actually worshiping God out there next to you? It's believers. If that, if that isn't you today, then, then in a minute you might be singing empty words. And that's fine. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying I want you to know who you're talking to. Like, like, actually know him. Like, not like, I want you to know who you're talking about. Like, no, I want you to know him. Like, I want it to, to, there to be a relationship. I want it to be a back and forth that you would grow in that knowledge. So, what are you worshiping now? Believer? Unbeliever? What are you worshiping now? To worship is, uh, is also to find one's significance in. To give oneself over to or to dedicate yourself to something. Romans 1 talks about this. I'll just flip there real quick because I think it would be helpful if we looked at Romans as we kind of wrap up here. John Acts Romans. There we go. Romans 1. I know, you'd think with all these things I have in my Bible, I would have one marking Romans 1. I should have thought about that first. Uh, <laughs> this page. It talks about, uh, Paul starts in verse 18, where he says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So why can't people who, are, who, who don't know God not worship him? Because they're suppressing the truth of who he is. Intentionally or unintentionally, it doesn't matter. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so, like, I want to, like, take time to unpack this, but we don't have a ton of time. Um, and, and I think Paul is being clear, pretty clear here, but I want to look at this one thing. Because this is what, this is what really kind of made, got me thinking on this. Is, uh, is when he says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And why is that important? Because, like, we see that everywhere. All over in our culture, in, in actually in any culture or society from the beginning of the world, there's been this idea. And it's interesting that it, it goes in almost, like, degrees of, what's the word? Like, uh, not honor, but, like, like, dignity, right? So if you think about, like, God as, like, the most honorable or high or, or uh, dignified thing to worship, right? The thing that's under that, when we have this idea that there's that, uh, this foolishness that creeps in, thinking we're wise, we, we begin to worship mortal man, right? And if, if, that's, if you don't see that going on today, then, like, I don't know how to help you, because, like, that's, like, our, our natural response. It's like somebody does something worthy or even not where they did just do something and end up going viral. And, like, we give them all this praise and honor and, and stuff like that and think they're great and want to meet them. Um, but then they change that. It's like this, this uh, is digression the right word here? They change the man for bird. And Paul says birds on purpose because, like, in, uh, in Greek thought, like, birds had God's eye eyes view. And so they were seen as, like, pretty noble creatures. So, like... After man who's made in God's image, the next thing would be like birds who have God's eye view. And then it's um, and it's animals, right? And you see that in, in idols and the things that people created out of stone and wood. And then it's creeping things, which is like things that crawl on the ground, bugs, insects, weird, like creepy crawlies and stuff. You see those things being worshipped. And then he says, therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts and to impurity and to dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves because they exchanged the truth about who God is for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This is something we see going on for, for all of us. And I hope you're not worshiping bugs, but that I hope you get the uh, di digression that that leads to, that we, it's this slippery slope of when we start to worship man and then other things, and then we, it's this like vicious cycle that takes us further and further of the truth of who God is, which says has been plain from the beginning of the world. So how do you know you're worshiping something other than God? This morning I want you to think about what can you not live without? Like, what if it was removed from your life this morning? Like, right now, you just knew that that thing was gone, would wreck the rest of your day, or week, or whatever. That's the thing you're worshiping. That's the thing that you've exchanged God for. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. Because like we talked about last week, anything we put before God can become an idol. So this morning, as we think about that, I just pray that our, our idea of God, our, our view of God, would, would be high. That it would be increased. That we would realize who we're talking to. When, when we're about to go to worship, and we are, and uh, worship team, if you want to start heading up, that's cool. Because we're going to go to communion. Um, that we would stray away, that we would get away from this small view of God that, that is that same idea, that, that foolishness, that wise in our own minds, 
kind of thinking. Or even pridefulness. That we could wonder at what God has done. And not that he's here to please that he's here to please us. We're here to please him. I want to just end on this and we'll uh, go to communion. Francis Chan. The solution to your problem. And I really do think this, and I put this in here on purpose, because I think if we could get this right, if we could get worship right, we would have a lot less problem than we do right now. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying that there's hard work to be done in there. But if we can understand that and we can have God in his proper place, it is that idea. Everything else kind of fades when we know who's seating seated on the throne. So as we go to communion, <clears throat> let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you that you have made it possible for us to know who you are and what you're like. You've given us the, uh, the Holy Spirit who has regenerated our hearts and our minds and made us alive together in Christ. We come together and worship you, and not just for an hour on Sunday, but throughout the week, and not to be caught up in these forms of worship or, or what feels right at the time, but to have this idea of who you say that you are and how you should be worshipped. Lord, that, that that is enough, that you, that you are enough, God, and that, that you would be enough for me and for us this morning. And when we look at your cross and we see, Jesus, what you've done, that you stood in our place and died for all the many things that I've done wrong and will continue to in the future, once and for all, and not just for me, but for everyone in this room, that would be enough, and that would stir our passions, and we would really worship, truly worship. We would engage in spirit and in truth. So, Oasis, this morning, as we worship together in a second, would you, uh, you can even stand with us right now as Rick plays. Just think about that. The, the work has been done. The way is open. He was crushed for our, our transgression and pierced for our iniquities. We can say amen and rejoice in that. Take and eat. And that one day when we stand before God and he asks us those questions about why we should even be here in his presence, that all we have to say is because I know Jesus and Jesus says they're one of mine well done and faithful servant because of that blood that was spilled on the cross. They can drink. All right, well, we're going to sing a few songs together. And uh, I just invite you to join us in that. Oh, 
before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow before him
good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am Sad. 
wrestling with and I didn't completely understand it as simple as it was the word he gave me was you need to shake off the worldly and embrace the heavenly I was like okay what does that mean though he's like just wait I'll tell you okay and then as I was preparing for worship and going through the songs and this song that we're getting ready to sing broken vessels is one of my favorites it's one that I can sing well it's one that I've practiced with and lived with and, men, and just meditated on. But something about the lyrics hit me differently this week. In verse 1, it says, All these pieces are broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended in a whole. Beautiful as they are, but think about them a little bit deeper, the way God opened them up for me. The pieces the, that are broken and scattered, that was me this week by my own doing, because I was doing everything by my own willpower. I broke myself and I got scattered everywhere. But it was his love and mercy that brought me back together and mended and made me whole again. He did that for all of us. It's like, okay, thanks. That was this morning. So then when I was trying to find some scripture to help cement that in my mind a little bit, I was searching for the jars of clay, and I was brought to the book, 2 Corinthians, in chapter 4, where my life verses are, and they hit me all over again in a different way, and I still love them, and I love them even more deeply. It's 16 through 18. It says, we do, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The things that are worldly are transient. The things that are heavenly are eternal. So my prayer, if you want to join me in it, this is for me, but I'll share it with anyone else. Father God, help me not to lose heart. The world is shattering me and tearing me down, but through you, my inward self is renewed. Everything of this world is momentary in comparison to you or your eternity, Lord. Help me remember that. Help me, Lord, shake off the worldly and embrace the heavenly. I can't embrace the heavenly without Jesus. And it was your mercy that let us have him so that we can come to the throne room and worship you the way you want to be worshiped, whether we're broken or whole, or lost. Without Jesus, there is no entrance. So thank you, God, for Jesus, that I can walk to your throne and embrace you. In Jesus' name, amen.
was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Oh, I can see the love in your eyes, laying yourself down, raising out the broken. Heal our streets 
Your keys. 